Hi there, my name is Jonathan Roth. This is Cambridge House Live. I am joined now by a legend in the finance business. I'm joined by Peter Schiff. He is the CEO and Chief Global Strategist of Euro Pacific Capital, and he's also the author of a new book entitled The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy, How to Save Yourself and Your Country. Peter, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me on. So listen, how can you save yourself and your country? Because it looks like the world is in a serious state of disarray. Well, first of all, I think all countries uh, can benefit from the, the economic advice in the book, the political advice, as far as my remedy for restructuring America or how we can change monetary and fiscal policy in the United States so that we can actually have a legitimate recovery mm -hmm. that raises living standards and provides productive jobs. But America, you know, I think Canada is not in this grave situation that America finds itself in, although you never know what the future might hold Sure. Uh, if Canadian politicians have their way. Canada could one day be facing this you know, predicament. Well, we did buckle but, down in yeah. the 90s and we cleaned up, a, cleaned yeah, up our act to a certain extent. Well, that's why you're in better shape now, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, there's no guarantees. But the United States, I think, is in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are focusing on Europe right now as if Europe's in more trouble. It's not. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is that Europe is being forced to, to reckon with its problems now. The bond market isn't giving them any more slack. Mm -hmm. So they've kind of run out of rope, and now they're at a point where they have to make some tough political choices as to what they do. Mm -hmm. In America, we've been able to delay those tough choices because the world is still lending us money, the Fed has still got interest rates at zero, and the Treasury can borrow for next to nothing, and so it doesn't have to cut anything. It can keep on expanding government and artificially stimulating this phony recovery that we have. And although I think ultimately, you know, the more of the stimulus we have, it, it doesn't have much of an effect and then it wears off quickly, which is what's sure. happening right now in the US. And right. I think we're headed back to recession. And the, the question is, is the Fed gonna come in? Is there gonna be more money printing as quantitative easing, which is what they call it? And you know, I think there's a good chance of that, but it's the wrong thing to do long term. Right, right. Okay, so let's just say that they do step in and that there is QE3. Where does that take us? How, how you know, we're kicking the can down the road yeah, here. Well, I mean, you, you have said, I've seen it on record here, sometime within 2013 to 2014, somewhere in yeah. there, we're going to see some sort of crash. Yeah, I think we're going to have a crisis. You know, I don't know that we're going to have time for QE4 or QE5, but I mean, ultimately, <laughs> that's where we're headed because mm -hmm. that's all QE does. Right. Each QE sows the seeds of the next QE. Because again, it's like you're trying to keep a, a drug addict high. And every time the drug wears off, if you want him to stay high, you gotta give him more. But you know, you're, he's not going to you know, get healthy if you keep him you know, knocked up on drugs. So every time they give us stimulus to create a phony recovery, the stimulus wears off and we get back to recession. And now we look for the same quick fix to get the phony recovery going, but we don't want to allow a real recovery because that means some real bitter tasting medicine needs to be swallowed. And that's going to be in the form of higher interest rates. There's going to be lower real estate prices, stock prices. Some banks are going to fail and the government is going to have to seriously cut spending, I mean, dramatically to everybody. I mean, we might have to restructure our debts so that our bondholders don't even get paid in full. But clearly, people who are expecting Social Security can't get all that money. People expecting government pensions can't get all their money. Current government employees can't get their current paychecks. They, they have to have reductions. A lot of government workers need to be let go. We simply can't afford to pay them. Okay, you know that there's an old saying that says people get the government that they deserve. I hope, I hope Well, I mean, it, there, look, I think the reality is is that the government, the U.S. federal government, seems to be acting the same way the average Joe citizen's acting out there. They're mortgaged to the hilt. They, you know, how many mortgages do they have in their house? Boats, cars, televisions, everything else that they have. And the government's acting the same way. Well, you got to, maybe you got the cart before the horse here because mm -hmm. the government is providing the incentives for people to behave that way. I mean, mm -hmm. when, when the Fed keeps That's your take on it. Well, when the Fed keeps interest rates artificially low, it doesn't just encourage the government to borrow, it, it encourages everybody to borrow. And it discourages people from savings. If you want to know why we have such a low savings rate, it's because the Fed has reduced the return on savings to a negative number. So people are responding to the bad incentives that are coming to them from government. If government acted more responsibly, if the Fed was independent, if interest rates were allowed to rise significantly higher, Americans wouldn't be borrowing. Mm -hmm. They would be saving. You know, and if we didn't have all these, uh, uh, the tax code that encourages certain activity and punishes others, we would have a free market allocating risk-taking, resources, behavior, 
So we would be a lot more responsible nation if the government didn't corrupt the process. So we've got to change the government uh, if we're going to make any progress on, you know, on, on Main Street. No, I think the reality is is that we have, I mean, the only politician that I've seen that's espousing the views that you're saying is Ron Paul. And he really hasn't, I mean, he's, he's tried to push it as far as he, as he possibly could, and he hasn't really got anywhere. Well, he's not the only one. I mean, there are other people. He's certainly doing it maybe with the most, uh, you know. In, with the in most the vigor. He's yeah, definitely he's, the, he's got know, the he's biggest the soapbox right, right now, and he's got a big following. Right. But there are other people running for Congress and certainly in state governments. They're certainly in the minority. And they don't get much media attention because. Do, the do you media think that's part of the problem? Because, like, what I wanted to say was, it feels as if Ron Paul, when he's running, the, the truth is he just simply doesn't get the votes. Like when he is out there, people just don't vote for him the way they do for you know. Well, I think a lot of that is, uh, you know, people just don't expect him to win. I mean, if the media tells you over and over again he can't win, right? And he's marginalized not only by the media but by all of his opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he just doesn't get the press, and it be, it becomes a self-defeating. Uh, a, a process, just like me. Look, when I ran for Senate, mm -hmm. yeah, I wanted you know, to ask you about that. You know, I, I ended up getting 23 percent of the vote in the three-way race, but right. you know, a couple of weeks before, I was polling in the low single digits, and how was that? You know, I was, I got no media coverage, I got, I, I got no endorsements from any of the papers. All my opponents got all the free media, all the endorsements. Well, yeah. you were you were running against Linda McMahon. We should well, we should state right. that who well, is Vince McMahon's wife from well, the World Wrestling. Yeah, and she uh, outspent me ten to one. But I was right. also running against Rob Simmons, mm -hmm. uh, who was an ex-congressman. But everybody assumed that I couldn't win. And I, how many people came to me and said, "Look, I wanted to vote for you, but I knew that I was throwing my vote away, so I had to vote for the lesser of the other two evils." Mm -hmm. Yet I ended up with twenty-three percent of the vote. If all the people that liked me but didn't vote for me because they didn't think I could win. I would have won if they had voted for me, but why didn't they think I could win? Because I had been marginalized in the polls. I was marginalized by the media. A lot of people didn't even know I was running because my name recognition was the lowest of the three candidates. Right, right. But I did, I did reasonably well. And I think you know, if more people um, were you know, thought that Ron Paul could win, and in fact, if you even look at the polls, Ron Paul does better against Obama than Romney. Yeah. Yet he's portrayed as a guy who can't win. You know, I think I, I think he could win. I think it would be very good for the country. But you think it, he might run on his own? I mean, he's, no, he's, he I, I, hasn't really I doubt said it that, because as, a, as I, don't know, I don't think he's going to win as a third party mm -hmm. candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, but and just electing him doesn't mean there's a painless solution. We are in a lot of trouble. We've had decades of bad monetary and fiscal policy. We've got a cancer in our economy mm -hmm. that needs to be cured, and it, it's not going to be painlessly. I mean, certainly some people it, it won't feel it as bad as others. But for people who are dependent on government who are living off of a government check, things have to change because the taxpayers who are making that possible can't afford it. The government has promised too much to too many people to buy their votes. And the politicians have to level with the American public, tell them how bad the situation is now, and what really needs to, done to grow the, be done to grow the economy. Because more government fixes, more printing press money, more borrowed money, more consumption, that's not, to do, that's not gonna do it. Now, I think there is a school of thought that says that part of the, the problem that you're just that you've just outlined, that problem is happening because of the influence of money in politics in the United States, where we've seen this huge influx of cash into campaigns and everything else, where we have guys who are bought and paid for. And I, look, I think the reality is it probably always was that way, yes. but we're seeing it to an extent that we have never seen before. Yeah, and that's despite all these campaign finance laws that right. only backfire and, right. and make it more about money. And and the problem is, you know, it makes it harder when I ran. Uh, as an independent, non-professional politician, the campaign finance laws worked against me. They made it harder for me to make, raise money. But it makes it very easy for the established incumbents to raise money mm -hmm. and to raise so much money mm -hmm. that it's hard for people to compete with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the real problem about the money in politics is the power in politics. We have given the power to the politicians. So it's only natural that the private sector is going to lobby for that power to be used in its in interest. Their best interest. And, and, right. and, if, and, if, and if somebody doesn't, then their competitor is going to lobby for that power to be used against them. So the key is you don't take the money out. You take the power away from the politicians. If they have nothing to sell, then no one's going to bid for it. There's nothing to buy. But as long as they're selling influence to the highest bidder, how can you fault people for bidding for it? That's the problem. So if we, if we get rid of all this government power, if we reduce government to its minimum size, which in America is supposed to be very small, we had a very small government uh, for the first 150 years or so of our, of our nation. And that's the reason why we, we prospered. That's why we grew so much faster than everybody else, is because we didn't have all the government restraints slowing us down. So to what extent do 
do you believe that Obama has been a disaster for the United States? Well, to every extent. I mean, yeah. he, he, there's nothing he's been, he's done that hasn't been, been bad. But yeah. unfortunately, you know, it's nothing new. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the Bush, the Bush. It's a continuation of Bush. Yeah, feeling. just yeah. only worse. It's just right. his policies only bigger and therefore they're worse in their grandeur. Right. You know, but the question is, what is uh, Mitt Romney going to do? Just mm -hmm. dial it back a little bit? Is he going to be somewhere between Bush and Obama, or will he be the same as Bush? Mm -hmm. But either way, I mean, it's not going to stop this train from heading into a cliff, the side of a cliff. You know, we need real legitimate change. Okay, oh, it, it, well, here's what, here's why I want to stop you on that one. Mitt Romney, this is a guy who, you know, really famous businessman, ran Bain Capital and did an exceptional job there. I don't think there's any argument about that. Mm -hmm. He stepped into the Olympics, which, let's face it, was a disaster yeah. at, at, at the uh, Salt Lake Games. And he cleaned it up and he made it a successful thing, which you have to give him a huge credit for that because yeah. that, that took some serious but that talent and mean... ability to do that. So yeah. I'm saying in terms of somebody to step in and potentially fix the United States, you know, on the one hand, I know you're advocating Ron Paul, maybe, yeah. but the reality is, is that if he, if he's not going to make it, maybe Mitt Romney's the second best chance. Well, I doubt that he's second best. I mean, he's second best if the only choices are him and, and Obama. Right. But uh, look, you know, just because he did a good job at Bain Capital, I mean, it doesn't mean he's going to be a good president. No, but I, I mean, Salt Lake City, I think, is really instructive because that is such a that's an international. You have so many interests there, a huge money, like. Yeah, I don't know what I mean, your look, take is maybe on Maybe he's a good, maybe he organized that well, but I think it's very different when you come into, into the White House as far as the politics of it. Sure. And, you know, if you just even listen to some of the things he said, he was asked in a press conference if he would support um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Ron Paul's proposal to cut a, million do a, a, a trillion dollars from the right, deficit right. in year one. I did hear that. Yeah, yeah, and his response was, no, I would be opposed to that right. because it would hurt the economy to take that much money out of the economy. Right. As if, you know, the government is what's taking it out. The government is taking it out of the private sector and putting it into the public sector. By cutting a trillion dollars, you free that money up to be returned to the private sector. It disturbs me mm -hmm. that Mitt Romney doesn't understand that. Right. And, you know, you can't cut government spending fast enough. The more we cut it, the better. Right. Now, all this said, I know that you're, you're sponsoring a, uh, or you're supporting a Republican, the, the gentleman who's running for the Senate seat that I think you ran for before. Yeah, well, you, you know, Linda McMahon is at it again. Yeah. She's got the, she's running to get the Republican nomination. Yeah. The Republicans... You, you have this interesting relationship with the Republican Party. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Well, you know, look, they're the only legitimate opposition to the Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, sometimes they're a bigger enemy to us than the Democrats. I mean, philosophically, I find myself more libertarian, but they never, you know, they can't amount to anything, really. Um, but, yeah, I'm supporting Chris Shays, who is a former congressman, uh, because, I, I, A, I believe that he can actually beat Chris Murphy, who is horrible. I mean, here's really the lesser of two evils. I mean, Chris Murphy would be a disaster. And I think if we nominate Linda McMahon again, we're going to get Chris Murphy. So that's one of the main reasons that, that I'm with, with Chris. But so many Republicans in the state are blinded by her money. And you thought that the loss last time would have opened their eyes. Mm -hmm. But no, they, they still see the dollar signs. And I, I think maybe they figure they're going to lose anyway. So they might as well make a buck off it. But, you know, we're going to be, I think, technically in a recession even by November. And so... It's going to be hard for people to vote Obama back into office in that circumstance. So I, you know, there could be a lot of Republican wins. The, the, the fear for me is what are they going to do with that victory? You know, because if they keep doing this, I mean, it's going to hit the fan. Yeah. Now, I thought that the collapse would have happened during Obama's first term. Right. And the events that I didn't foresee mm -hmm. was how the European situation would play out ahead of ours mm -hmm. and how that would divert attention from America to Europe and how that would buy us time. Sure. Because I think the only reason we're able to accumulate all this debt and to keep our interest rates so low is because Europe makes it possible. Right, There's all so the money's still coming to the US. Right. right, and so I think that has extended the process and maybe it's extended it into the Obama second term or maybe the Romney first term. Right. But the question is, if it really collapses on Romney's watch, then what is the public gonna do? Are we gonna say, aha, you see, we should have kept Obama. Capitalism really doesn't work. You know, because it already got a bad rap uh, uh, from from uh, from Bush, right. when of course it wasn't capitalism, but the lack of it that caused the problems. And so we can have an even bigger backlash, and maybe get even somebody worse than Obama to follow a one-term Romney administration. Uh, because if we keep doing this policy of stimulus and growing government, 
you know, it's just going to get worse for the average American. Our standard of living is going to fall. Eventually, our currency is going to collapse. Prices are going to skyrocket. And it's going to be a lot worse uh, for the average American, especially, you know, when the government is the one looking for a bailout. And right now, you've got countries like uh, first Greece, now Spain, looking for a bailout. Okay, yeah, Germany could bail out Spain if it wanted to. It's a mistake. It could do it. Who's going to bail out America? Right. You know, we're, we're right. so enormous. You know, it's the expression, too big to fail. Well, we're too big to bail. Meanwhile, look at how much money the Chinese and the Japanese have already spent trying to prop us up. You know, they flushed trillions down a toilet trying to prop up the American consumer, but it can't be done because we're all broke. So what extent do you think inflation is is, come, is around the corner? And do you think we're going for Zimbabwe-style inflation well, with the U.S. dollar? Where I don't is think it's going? around the corner. I think it's here. I mean, we're on yeah. Inflation Street right now, or right. Inflation Alley, whatever you want to call it. What might be around the corner is much worse inflation right. or hyperinflation, mm -hmm. depending on how long we push this monetary envelope. Mm -hmm. Right? If we keep doing QE, QE, if we keep shooting the economy up with stimulus until it overdoses, then we get hyperinflation. If, on the other hand, we recognize the error of our ways and we reverse the policy, then we'll put a break on it. But, you know, the longer we wait to do that, the worse it's going to be are, are there, know, are as there, far as the, the, the immediate pain. Are there any outside events that could step in and intervene to force the U.S. government to change what it's doing? Or does it have to come from the political class in terms of recognizing the problem and trying to figure no, out No, I here. think it's going to be forced to do it, to, to change what it's doing by outside forces. I don't think U.S. politicians on their own are going to say, this is what we need to do, mm -hmm. right? Bring okay. on the that's, pain that's what I was to cure the economy. Right. It's going to be external. Look, just like, look, you know, the Greek politicians would have kept on borrowing and spending no, in if, it, if, it, if, if, yeah, if it wasn't for the bond markets mm -hmm. not wanting to cooperate. So our politicians are going to be no different. They're going to postpone the pain as long as they can to get to every election that they can until some external force puts pressure on them. And now they can see that the, the, the cost of, of, of continuing this is going to be worse than just doing the right thing and, and biting the bullet. And whether it's the Chinese, the Japanese, the, just the bond vigil, vigilantes, I mean, whatever it's going to be that's going to force them to have to act responsibly, it's going to happen. You know, it, it, but, but the problem, as I said, is because we've waited so long to deal with it, we've made the problems much worse, right? And and now it's it's much more you know disruptive to try to solve them because we've built up this gigantic dependent economy. Everyone's dependent on cheap money, the banks, individuals, the government. We have massive imports. We import six hundred billion dollars worth of stuff every year because we don't make enough. Why don't we make enough? Because we don't save enough, so we don't have capital, and we have too much government, too much regulations. It makes us uncompetitive. All this is a function of this phony economy that's kept together by this cheap money. And when it goes away and the whole thing unravels and we realize just how screwed up our economy is and we have all these misallocated resources, putting the pieces back together again is not going to be easy, especially if you're one of the pieces and so, you don't like you know, having to be rearranged. So I hear what you're saying and you've outlined a really good case in terms of where it's going. So the question is, how do you save yourself then? What, well, what can you do? What, what does the average person do? Well, this is all about saving yourself kind of financially. And, right. and not about, I mean, some people, if you're really worried mm -hmm. about the political and social consequences of what might happen, you, you know. You oh, they're getting leave. out of Dodge. Yeah, yeah you can yeah. go someplace where you think it's physically safe. Or sure. if you think it'll be hard to take money out of the country, we'll take it out now. Although it's certainly a lot harder for Americans. And you saw the way they jumped all over the co-founder of Facebook, one of the co-founders right, for right. renouncing who, who his citizenship. to save a ton of tax money. Yeah, and yeah. you know, they act as if that's a bad reason to give up your citizenship. Mm -hmm. That's the best reason I can think of. It's called freedom. Hey, my, I don't have enough freedom here. Mm -hmm. The government is taking too much of, of what I produce. I want to go someplace else where I can keep more of my produce. That's freedom. America was founded by people who renounced their British citizenship over taxes. Right. So how can you blame their, their, you know, their prodigy for wanting to leave for the same reason, but in my book, you know, I outline a lot of ways to invest: mm -hmm. commodities, resources, gold and silver, right. emerging market economies, right. foreign bonds, foreign stocks. Different ways to get out of what I think is potentially a doomed currency, or if it's not doomed, a currency that will be significantly debased. And so, anybody who's counting on it to provide purchasing power in the future is making a mistake, and they need to change their investment strategy. Okay, I, I want to get into some of those strategies here in a moment, but I want to touch quickly on Europe. 
The situation in Europe is, is obviously very dire. I think there is a school of thought out there now, and George Soros has kind of enunciated this within the last couple of days, and uh, it's something that I've been reading about for the last couple of months, is that what we're seeing there may have actually been, I guess what I'm asking you is, do you think it was actually engineered to happen the way it's happening? Because what it's doing is, it's forcing the countries to come together in some sort of closer political union. Either the euro dissolves, or there's a closer political union, and that's what the developers, the, the guys who, who birthed the euro, that's what they wanted. Well, maybe they did want that, but mm -hmm. I doubt they were smart enough to plan it this way. Sure. I, mean, I think, might they but take I think advantage? It was incremental. They yeah. knew that there would be steps right. along the way that would bring things closer together. Right. As they, but I don't yeah. think they, they plan, I, they, I don't think they thought the journey would take quite this, uh, sure. this direction. Sure. But yes, you know, just like American politicians, maybe the European politicians who want bigger government, more central government, don't want to waste this crisis, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to waste the opportunity. Right. But, you know, this is ba a basic flaw in the structure of the Eurozone that I pointed out the day it was proposed. And, and what I didn't like about it is each country was able to have a debt to GDP. They said, you can't have more than 3% debt to GDP. And what I said at the time is, well, then everybody's going to have 3%. Why would you have 2%, 1%? Why would you have balance? Because you could push the cost of the deficit onto your neighbors. So I said, this is going to create a problem where all the countries in the Eurozone are going to want to have deficits. And it's a moral hazard. And it became worse when they actually went through the 3% and there was no consequences. So now the government said, well, I'm going to have the biggest deficit possible. And so the way the Eurozone is, is structured today, it's impossible. So it either has to dissolve in some way or it has to change. But I, don't, I think changing it in a way that would accommodate the Greeks or the Spanish or the Italians uh, is a real bad deal uh, for Europeans. It's a real bad deal certainly for the Germans. So I think they're better off maybe allowing certain countries uh, to leave and try to uh, have a stronger euro with fewer members. Uh, because to just cave the lowest common denominator and let all these politicians off the hook. You see, it, it's all about trying to prevent politicians from having to tell the truth and make cuts. And say, look, we promised all these benefits, but we can't deliver. Now, some of the politicians, like in Greece or in Italy, are used to being able to inflate away. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to renounce you know, their promises and cut, they were able just to print money and say, see, I kept my promise. Yes, well, your money's not worth very much now, but I paid it to you anyway, and they can blame the inflation on somebody else. But now they're looking for another easy solution because they don't have the inflation option. So they need this bailout option. Mm -hmm. But I think cooler heads in Europe need to prevail. And I, I think they need to dig their heels in and, and not just cave into it. Now, so, maybe so you if think they that's do, what needs to happen? Yeah. What's, what's going to happen? I don't know. If you were I don't a betting know. man. I don't know how it's going to resolve itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly I can see them doing something that will appease the markets in the short run by creating some kind of socialized zone where every nation is responsible for all the debts of the other nations. They have to put some kind of, uh, you know, restraints in there to try to, uh, you know, mitigate the moral hazards that would be obvious. And so maybe they can convince the markets that there's some real teeth in there. But again, in the future, it'll be the same as it is now. I mean, whatever's gonna happen, you know, they're just putting off the pain. It would be much better for the long-term health of Europe if they dealt with the pain and let these economies restructure, uh, force governments uh, into austerity, which is good for the people, but they're not doing that. But, you know, whatever happens, and I think this is the bigger point, however they resolve it in the short run, good or bad, whatever they do, mm -hmm. right, it's gonna take the pressure off the Eurozone temporarily and put it right back on the dollar, on the US. Now, unless somehow Japan can, can jump into the mix and become the next crisis before America, which I don't think the odds would favor that. I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, but you know, when, when the world is focusing on America, it is, it, there is no short-term fix that can work anymore because we've been doing these short-term fixes for a long time. You know, we got a little extra rope from this European crisis, right? But it wasn't it wasn't used as a lifeline. It was a noose, sure. right? And, and you don't think it's going to last for very long, obviously, clearly. I, I so. don't think, look, yeah. something's going to happen in Europe because right. this can't just go on indefinitely. Right. And, and, and the numbers are just so big for the U.S. Interest yeah. rates have got to rise, yeah. or the Fed is going to have to print so much money to keep them from rising mm -hmm. that inflation is going to flare up to, in a way that even government numbers can't hide it anymore. Mm -hmm. The world's going to see the predicament we're in. There's going to be tremendous pressure on the dollar. Mm -hmm. you know, even recently, look, you know, Japan and China just announced 
that bilaterally they're not trading in dollars anymore. They're going to trade in their own currencies. And this has been happening with other countries too. And as the dollar is taken out of more and more of global trade, and it's going to continue to, you know, to lose its status as a reserve currency until the point where it's no longer a reserve currency at all. So what does the smart investor do? Given, given the landscape that we've just laid out here, what does the smart investor do? Where do they park their well, money? Well, first you avoid dollars, you sure. know, and you probably even, you know, euros, I mean, euro might bounce, but long term, I don't like to, you know, I think there's a lot of problems because you don't even know what you own mm -hmm. if you own the euro. Right. Uh, but there are other currencies that are not dollars or euros or yen for that matter that you can own. But I think gold is much better. I, I think money is safer than any currency. Where do you think gold's going? A lot higher. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, gold's been can trading. Can you define that? No, because I don't know how much money they're going to print. Right. But I think it's going to go a lot higher. And I think, you know, right now gold's kind of acting or as, a, as a risk asset. Mm -hmm. It's not. It is the safe haven asset. It's the treasuries that are the risky asset that somehow have, 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 have stolen uh, gold's uh, you know luster as being a safe haven, they're not a safe haven. And certainly, when people start to worry about treasuries, right? Treasuries can't be a safe haven from treasuries. Uh, so people are going to have to look for something. And, and you know, gold is real money. It's not just a money substitute. So, and I think the mining stocks. We're here at a mining conference, yeah. and these mining stocks are ridiculously cheap. As yeah. a so, group. you think this is a good time to buy a junior mining stock? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. don't you know? You don't have to buy. You're invested here. Well, I'm invested. I'm not because I'm here. I'm no, no, I mean in, in the junior mining sector. Yeah, yeah. I have some, and, and, and you know, and, and we own them in funds that I manage. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that sector. And also, stocks all around the world, particularly in Asia and some of the emerging markets that I think are beaten down, and people are worried about how a collapse in the U.S. economy is going to adversely affect Asian economies that export to America. Mm -hmm. I think if they actually let us collapse, those economies would boom. See, the problem for Asia is not that we, America collapses, but, but, but that they prop it up. It's the cost of propping up the U.S. economy that is so costly to it's, Asia. It's the cover-up that gets you. Yeah, if they just yeah. let America collapse and let their own currencies rise, mm -hmm. they would be fine. You know, they would have explosion of domestic demand. They could trade with one another. They would find out they don't need America. But because they think they need us so badly, they're, they're spending so much money to prop us up so that we can buy things that we can never pay for. Mm. And so in the process, capital is taken from their economies and transferred to ours in a way that undermines their own economic growth. And they're, they're, they haven't been able to connect those dots yet. Mm. Well, listen, we could spend so much more time talking. Yeah. We have already uh, gone through a lot of time here, but I really appreciate your time. And I know you've been right on a lot of this stuff in the past. And it would, yeah. it's, I think it's pretty clear from the, some of the signals that we're getting that you're probably right here in the future too. But I appreciate your time. Sure, thanks for having me on the show. Okay, appreciate it.